What does it look like to be almost 60 years old and eating all meat for 15 years? In this interview, you'll learn about the best way to stick to a carnivore diet, what it feels like to have sugar addiction, how to support yourself with community, and how carnivore has changed over the years. Hey guys, my name is Judy Cho and I'm board certified in holistic nutrition. And I have a private practice where we worked with over 2000 carnivore clients and patients, helping them get to root cause healing, often starting with the carnivore cures, all meat elimination diet. Today, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dr. Lisa Wiedemann. I interviewed her many years ago, and I will link to her original interview in the show notes. We talk about all things being almost 60 years old and thriving on a carnivore diet for 15 years. We also talk about what trends she's seen over the years, how she's viewed or what changes she's made since being carnivore and how her view of the carnivore community has changed over the years. We talk about fads and trends in the carnivore space and what it takes to really heal and what she has learned from her N equals one of carnivore healing and what she's seen with her groups and her one-on-one clients. We talk about all these things. If you're interested in doing carnivore successfully and doing it for the long term and what is required, I highly recommend watching this full interview. Let's get right into it. Hi, Dr. Lisa. It's been so long since I've had you on my channel, but for the people that are listening and watching that may not have heard of you, if you can introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Judy, for having me on. I just you know, love talking about this whole topic of health and wellness and carnivore, because that's been the, the, the thing that's really changed my life around. So I'm an optometric physician for a little over 33 years. I have been carnivore for just over 15 years now when I found the zeroing in on health uh, little forum way back in 2009 and fortunate enough to have crossed paths with it on a you know, internet surfing, diligent search, because I suffered for 30 really, really long years. I know, you know, my story, but others might not that I, I was just such a disordered eater. I'm so addicted to sugar, carbs, processed foods, secretive eating, you name it. I did it because I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And I'm so grateful that I came across that website because that was the point where there was other women in there talking about how they healed their disordered eating. And then there was people in there talking about how they healed their diabetes and their depression and all this stuff. And it just was this world opened up to me. And I said, wow, this is powerful, but really <laughs> we just eat meat. <laughs> okay. Let's jump in because this was the biggest ray of hope I had ever come across through all of my suffering. So that's really where I'm at. And then, you know, it, this, this evolved into, I kind of just went about my life for quite a while. And then when I saw Dr. Sean Baker on Joe Rogan and different people who were starting to talk about this, and then people were jabbing back with comments like, well, that's all great, but it's not sustainable. And that's not possibly sustainable. You can't do this long-term. And I was like, wait a minute, let me step in here a second and say something. That's really how this came about was me raising my hand. And now I, you can't stop me because back then when I wanted to shout it from the rooftops, nobody wanted to listen. And it really did seem wacky. And I felt like I was flying my freak flag with this whole thing, but Meanwhile, this is ancestrally natural and normal, right? I mean, you know it as well as I do. Everybody else, they're the ones that are eating weird by eating Pop-Tarts and cookies and ice cream and all this stuff that isn't normal and natural to a human being who's on earth. What I find so fascinating, and I commend you for being brave. And I mean, 15 years ago, people were still really into that saturated fat is so bad. I mean, most people still believe that today, but when there wasn't a Sean Baker around, there was no podcast sharing that meat is good for you. What made you decide I'm willing to try this, even though it goes against everything we believe. And, and then how how has life been being 15 years carnivore? Yeah. So interesting back then I could say that I, I clung to the connection with the group and that's why I'm so, you know, really, I I just feel so strongly about staying in a group and staying connected and having the support because 
if I didn't have it back then with them, that they were great. They, it was Charles Washington and this group of people that they were doing research, you know, Vilmar Stephenson, Owsley, the Bear Stanley, looking into the whole Atkins thing, because everybody would say, well, I did Atkins induction phase and it worked so well. And then of course, everybody says, but I gained the weight back. Well, that's because you climbed the carb ladder, so to speak. And guess what? <laughs> For many people, and in my world, you climb right back into your addiction and you have a hard time stopping and saying, I'm full and there's no there's no sensor that shuts that off and there's no intuitive eating when you're eating addictive food. So I was just really fortunate that these people that were in there were journaling and this was all before Zoom and before Facebook and all that. So it was just the, the ray of hope that I had that there was a couple women in there that said they were relieved of their eating disorder with this. And I said, all right, I know this is crazy, Lisa, come on, but let's just jump in. And I decided I was just going to be my own N equals one experiment. And at that point, continue my research, continue learning, reading, you know, there's, there was all sorts of different, you know, I don't want to say studies because there, there really is so little on this, but there were, there were quite a few things to look at. And then, you know, the book fat of the land and not by bread alone. These are like old, old writings and talking about this, this way of eating and that there's really nothing detrimental to your health by doing this. And if anything, it was just so beneficial. So I, like I said, I jumped in while I researched and I thought, well, what do I have to lose? I, I could lose an eating disorder. I could lose my addiction to sh sugar. And would I cause harm to my heart in the meantime? Because that's the message on the street. Like you can't eat all red meat. And yeah, I was through this whole period of time where like in college, of course it was, it was no fat and just, you know, rice cakes and chicken breast, boneless, skinless chicken breast and all that, because, you know, you don't eat fat. And so it was, it was really turning everything that I thought I knew upside down and just having faith that, that, that this was going to come out. Okay. And it sure as heck did. <laughs> yeah. I totally can really, I think I was plant-based for 12 years and I thought this is so crazy, but I think when you get to a point of desperation and you hear stories of hope, you're just willing to cling on to everything because everything you've tried doesn't work fully. And I think that's the whole power in the carnivore diet. And so I always say for all the plant-based advocates or all the people that are so against the diet, I always think, why don't you try it first before you knock it with all your Mediterranean studies? Uh, research and all the other things that they can say that are, you know, the uh, meta analysis of all the studies show that this way of eating is better. And it's like, sure, fine. But let's why don't you just try it first before you really say it doesn't work. Do and then you have how, how much of it is propaganda with that right, blue zone stuff. And I mean, we don't have to get into political <laughs> issues. But that's when I really got that moment, like, okay, so not only are we supposed to eat butter and not margarine, but we should be out in the sun and not putting that chemical sunscreen on. And it just went on and on. And I was just like, so eager to just find out the truth about everything because I was feeling so good. And I was seeing people around me who were doing this in my group, just, just really flourishing. And I said, you know, I, and I, I think one thing too, is I'm, I'll be 60 this year. And I feel like if people come at me and say, I, I have people sending me things all the time now. Well, so-and-so says it's okay for the short term, but you can't do this long term and you're going to ruin your acid base balance and all this stuff. And I said, you know, really, I was ruining my body with cookies and donuts and ice cream and pizza. I, I'm not thinking that by eating ancestrally that I'm going to ruin my health. And I don't know if nothing else, I can hopefully be a representative of somebody who's still here without scurvy and without a heart attack. And I have to get in touch with Dr. Ovedia and probably just out of curiosity, people say, have you had a CAC score 15 years of eating fatty red meat? And I go, no, I haven't yet. Just because I just, I've taken myself out of the medical system too. And I just don't feel the need to test because 
I'm really working hard on all the pillars of good health and I'm not anxious to do a test to get a false positive or a false negative or any of that, you know? Yeah. And you can also run a, if you don't want to go and do a whole CAC score, because there is a little bit of radiation you get, you can do like a, a NMR panel, which is just a more detailed version of your cholesterol levels of the different sizes. And, but it comes also with a LPIR score. So it's a, another measure of insulin. So if you just do that, that should be very indicative, but sure. I mean, if you want to have all the internet trolls kind of quiet yeah. down, it's obviously a good thing, but you know, them. it's always figuring out which makes sense. But I want to say you look nowhere near the age of 60. So if Thanks. eating this way will help us age gracefully, I, I love that. And has there been a difference since obviously 15 years is a very long time. I mean, most people use longitudinal studies where they survey people eating one way. And then over time, they, after periods of time, they'll redo all this test. But from just looking at you, you can tell that you are a measure of health. Has anything changed? I know that some people say you got to eat higher fat. You have to add electrolytes, but I'm curious for you specifically in the 15 years of eating this way, has anything really changed? You know, I try to think back 15 years ago (laughs) when I first sat behind the computer and was trying to read what these people were actually doing. And I remember specifically, it was this whole thing. Don't fear fat. You need fat. You're not going to be eating 90, 10 ground beef and trimming the fat off. You've got, you're eating the fat and to the fat, the point of saying like some people were cooking their burger and pouring the fat over the burger meat in the bowl and eating the whole thing and all this stuff. So fortunately at the beginning, I guess I had a good starting point of knowing that I could just really eat and not worry so much. I I didn't track anything. And, and the, the interesting thing too, is as much as I find it intriguing, the whole testing as far as ketones and glucose, because I'm very analytical and I like numbers and I'm medical and science, right? And, but I will say in the 15 years that it's been, it's only been the past, I'm going to say three or four years ago, I got my first ketone glucose monitor. And back then we, the thought, the, the conversation was, well, you're not peeing on those strips. They're not accurate. What do we care? Why do we even really want to know that? Obviously, if you had seizures and you had a specific reason there, that's, you know, a a different issue, but, um, but it was like, why, why, why are we testing? And that's, that was really how I, 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 I went along and no, we had no electrolytes back then. There were no companies making these multiple flavors and stevia sweetened things. And I'm, I'm actually really glad because, you know, I try to talk to people about for, for most people who come from my world of being drawn back into what I call the carb ditch and relapsing that it's really important to get rid of the taste of sweet. Cause if you keep triggering the sweet sensors on your tongue, what do we think is going to happen? You're just going to keep craving. And the electrolyte thing has seemed like it's a big, you know, mate, yeah, obviously I guess there's some people who benefit from it and people talk about the cramps, but maybe the electrolytes are causing your cramps because you've got yourself so out of balance and you have to just really think about those different uh, angles to it instead of just, you know, what we should and shouldn't be doing. There was really not much rules back then as far as, you know, what to do or not to do other than, you know, eat from the animal kingdom and don't eat anything else. (laughs) Yeah. I love that. So ever since starting a practice, everything is different than what I experienced myself, right? So we learn when it's our own N equals one things may differ from then when we're working with other people or having clients or coaches, but you find very quickly that not everything works for everyone, but it's interesting because I do believe in symptomatology. It sounds like the first 10, 12 years of your journey. And a lot of what zeroing in on health did was trust your symptoms. Like trust, if you're feeling better, why, why have to do blood work? Why have to do certain things? And I know people can say, well, it's because I don't want to have risks that I didn't know that I was about to have a heart attack if I just checked my measures. But I know back then we didn't have enough data with enough people doing carnivore. And so if we saw the LDL went up back then, we might've been scared and we didn't have anyone else around us sharing. It's actually kind of normal that total cholesterol goes up on a carnivore diet or LDL. And so maybe it was just better that people just didn't do their blood work 
And then they went by symptoms because even in our practice, the biggest way with all the tests that we do, the biggest way we have our clients trust the process is through their symptoms. But most people want the data. They want the number that shows, no, tell me that I'm safe with this one marker. And, and we try to teach them that one marker is not indicative that you will not have a heart attack event or a cardiovascular event. Right. And so you, you can have a CAC of zero and right. a heart event. I yes. mean, people say, no, that's, you know, they think the CAC is a be all and end all and, and it's really not. And, you know, Judy, when you were saying these people, they're like, they want the number and they want us, sometimes it's a, a, a family member who's really concerned and they're trying to quiet them by saying, see, this isn't so bad. Or, you know, I, I find that quite a bit where people who have others who don't understand right. what we're doing here or why, and they're, they're, they really want some confidence in a concrete test, you know, to be able to reassure people. You've now opened up coaching because you were getting so inundated. I remember when you first started and you would get so inundated with all the questions and you tried your best to just, you know, message through DMs. And eventually it's like, well, I think people want more from you than just that. So you started doing one-on-one -on -one and now you have groups and stuff, but tell me how, it's changed for you. So I know zeroing in on health has certain rules, quote unquote rules of maybe just maybe rules to live by in terms of the carnivore diet. And I initially followed them, but I found that it doesn't work for everyone. It definitely worked for me, but it doesn't work for everyone. What have you seen over the years now coaching it, it not just being your N equals one? Well, I think one of the important things is I, I try to say, I I'm really not dogmatic about actual rules of carnivore, because, you know, let's not fret about having a little avocado or an olive or a pickle or things that what I say, because you have to remember too, Judy, the majority of people who come to me are people who are suffering from the relapse situation where they, they have health issues, they know what they're supposed to do, and they just can't stay consistent. And so I, th I think what happens is I, I tell people, you know, you have to understand what things, and I just use this term, what things you have sober behavior around. I use the example of a fresh ball of mozzarella. If it's in my fridge, it calls my name till it's gone. I have no sober behavior with it. It's like, I want to eat the ends. And then once I've eaten both <laughs> the ends, I'm going in and and then it, it's interesting. So as part of my journey going forward, and I'll say, because I feel like I was very severe in the, in, in the draw to, I, I, I can't even explain, well, cause we know that sugar and carbs and processed food all kind of are the same thing. And they're more addictive than cocaine and heroin. And mm -hmm. there's, and, and then there's an emotional void that a lot of us turn to food and use it as our comfort. And that's another thing that has to be addressed that going carnivore doesn't solve. But as long as I tell people that if you eliminate things, you don't have sober behavior around. And for many, it could be a bag of pork rinds in their pantry. Or I tell them, I say, you know, if I cook a pound of bacon, I pretty much will eat a pound of bacon. <laughs> and if it's there and I say, okay, I've had enough and I walk away and then I smell it and I see it and I pick it up and I eat some more. And so those kind of things are important for people to understand that this isn't just a one size fits all. This doesn't just work for everybody because there's a lot of other things that need to be addressed. And, you know, in your situation with your clients, it's typically a lot of health issues, either with microbiome, like lots of different issues, the mold toxicity, all of that stuff. And in, in more in my world, it's the people that are really, they understand, but it's the, the, what they feel is impossible to stay on track. And that's a whole different situation, but yeah, no, it doesn't work for everybody. And we have to be flexible and, you know, I, you know, I think you, we're on the same page. You say, you know, starting out with a, an elimination diet and at least trying to start get to the root cause of a lot of things that are in a lot of people's diets shouldn't be there, right? So that's step one. And sometimes it's really hard to even get to step two because people have a hard time 
imagining life without ice cream or without chocolate and without their coffee with cream and sweetener in it. You know, I could go on and on. So yeah, it's, it's a tough one, but I, I think that this has to be very flexible in the approach to just say, it's not just eat meat, drink water, and all will be well. I think the struggle that I have even with our clients is I think it's a, it comes down a lot to the personality and the motive of the person. But sometimes I think if we go too strict or we go too hard, then they're like, I will only get better if I have perfection. And then that perfection drives them to fail every few days. But then if we try to say, okay, fine, maybe you can add a little bit of the stevia electrolytes. I see that that also makes them struggle or it's the thing that gives them the crutch. So it really depends on the person, but it's so hard because when we do messaging, on social media, people only get short snippets of us. And so one time, maybe I'll say, sure, you can use these electrolytes that have stevia, but for the general population, it probably isn't really good for your gut microbiome. Like you said, the addictive side, like I couldn't have done any sweetener in the beginning. Now I can probably dabble in it, but it took three years of being super, super strict because then that would trigger me to eventually binge. So I knew that that was something I needed, but I, I don't know how many of our clients nowadays go super strict without those electrolytes because we've normalized it in the carnivore community. So I I fully agree with you there. And then I just wonder, you know, when we see the Paul Saladinos or the Ray Peter sharing, like just eat heavy meat and add some fruit. And, and that then allows people to think I don't need to be super strict because then I can still heal. Look at all these other people. But I do think part of the magic of carnivore is going super strict, at least initially, it may not fix everything, but at least, you know, okay, it's not the diet for sure. I need to pursue something else. Maybe it's the mental health side. And we see that all the time. A lot. We ask the question, do you have a poor relationship with food? And people will say, oh, I used to binge, but no more. Oh, I don't have any issues. And time and time again, especially for the women, when we start tracking their meals, we're like, oh, you eat only certain foods because you know, calorically what that comes out to, or they get really scared about adding a little bit more fat and you see the, the disordered eating in it. So that, I mean, in a sense, everyone would want to have to work with you in terms of the disordered eating, but I, I don't think it's just, at least our practice is not just the healing they need in chronic illness. I do think a lot of people unknowingly suffer from disordered eating. And we had a lot of people end up going to Overeaters Anonymous because they realize there's a lot bigger of an issue of turning to food. Yeah. And, and back to what you had said that sometimes you do find when you go down to, and I like to call it a limited selection instead of a restricted diet. Like, I don't want anybody to feel this is so restrictive. I want people to try because it has been so beneficial for so many people I work with to do something like what we call a repetitive meal method or a meal on repeat. And it takes a lot of the emotion out of it. It takes decision out of it and it becomes very freeing. And some people say, Oh my God, how do you do that? It's just so boring. It's so repetitive. I was like, Oh my gosh, it became one of the most wonderful things that I've ever tried. And it it sounds strange, but there are some people who actually really do need that type of limit limitation to learn for themselves what is true hunger and mm-hmm. and and what is satiety. And it it's it's a very difficult thing because it's mixed in with emotion, anger, anxiety, boredom, depression, like all of these things and family issues, financial issues. You know, there's so much that's intermixed with this, that it's, it's a very, very complicated topic. And I mean, I'm, I'm us talking about all the different aspects I think is actually really helpful for people to understand that, you know, we could say this isn't a one size fits all because there's so much complexity to it. And it has to be where you understand you're on a journey and month by month, year by year, You will figure things out and hopefully your body is going to signal to you by improvements. And I tell people journal what's going right and, and just know that your, our bodies are here to evolve, right? We just have to get out of their way, but that includes things like stress, sunlight, grounding, you know, we could go on and on with all the other extras that are important sleep in in particular, you know? 
So in the 15 years that you've been doing it, has the food addiction resolved? Has it improved? Is it easier? Where is it for you? Yeah, that's such a great and difficult question because, you know, I, I recently interviewed both Bitten Johnson and Vera Tarman because of the, the trying to get my group and myself to get this great understanding about the actual addiction. And I talked about how at the beginning, when you first give up and, and let's face it, it's not, we have to choose to give it. It's not like we can't have this anymore. We're choosing not to, cause we're understanding this food is toxic. Okay. But you're taking away a best friend from somebody who's a binger and somebody who consoles themselves with food, right? So the first stage is really what I call, it's the struggle. It's the white knuckle. It's the, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to do this? It's, it is a struggle, but with the support and help of interaction with others who are doing it, you get through the struggle. And then I say the next stage is it's a battle. Now you're in battle. Now get up your shield Get out your sword because everywhere you turn, there's a trigger. Whether it's at work, in the break room, you walk into a grocery store from floor to ceiling, it's chips and bakery, and you walk into a mall to shop and it's Mrs. Fields cookies is wafting, you know, through the, th through the air and it, you have to be prepared. You have to have a plan and you're in battle. And then, you know, I, I think the next stage that you get to is, you, you get to a point where you're at peace with the fact that I'm at peace, the fact that I, I'm not a normal eater. I will never be able to sit at a table with a whole bunch of people and laugh and eat some cheesecake and just have, you know, whatever. I just know I can. And that's what I've been dealt in life. And you have to come, come to terms with that. But I will say for sure, because of my love of cheese, yet my and and here here's also for me i don't have a negative effect eating cheese i i kind of wish i was allergic to it i <laughs> wish i got stuffed i wish i got zits i wish something happened but nothing happens other than me wanting to eat more and me wanting to fry it and me, me yeah. wanting to make more recipes with it and so in answer to your question i through the years and through a lot of really just trying to understand for myself where I actually do sit on the spectrum of food addiction. I just feel once an addict, you're an addict, but that doesn't mean you're always struggling. And that doesn't mean you're always in a constant battle with it. It just means you have to evolve with it. And I have evolved with it in that I do not keep cheese in my fridge. I eat it when I'm at a restaurant because there's portion control. I might eat a little blue cheese crumbles because I know I have sober behavior with that. I don't eat the whole package of blue cheese crumbles. So it's it's strange, but I I feel that over time, that term that you have to think is, do I have sober behavior with this? And if I don't, it really doesn't belong in my food plan because then you'll start to struggle. No, I love that. So you put a lot of the, the side of our, our habits that we're not fully cognizant of, and maybe we just use these foods or behaviors when we're not really thinking, but we're emotional and, and maybe we use it as an escape, but it sounds like a lot of what you do is you just start making everything very in your face, uh, logical so that you can understand it. And I think that makes a lot of sense. If this food is a trigger or triggers you to then want to eat more or binge on it or lean on it for hunger, even if you're not hungry, I think those are good ways to maybe just remove that from your pantry and I, or your refrigerator. And I think that makes sense. I, I agree with everything you said, even for me as a recovering bulimic, I, I don't say I'm recovered just in case, because I know it just takes one or two days of falling and then struggling that you're back at it. So I always say I'm recovering, even though I have not done any purge method in years, but I know um, how slippery that slope is. So to, I am very mindful. And although I say I've tried a little bit of sugar, maybe like a spoonful, I've never had a full, like a cone of ice cream. I've never done it since being carnivore meat based. And so I, I think I know inherently that that's a, that would be a trigger if I were to eat like a full brownie or a full cookie, like I've never done that. So, but I've tried like a little dabble and maybe that's safe enough for me, but I'm not willing to try a full thing. Um, yeah. So, so I totally get it. 
Yeah. And one of the other things that I, I say, because I say, look, you, you have to understand that, you know, and I'm, I'm talking to people who have really, really struggled. And I said, you have to give yourself permission to make your way through this. But if it takes eating a pound of bacon to, to prevent you from eating a single bite of cookie, that's what you do. And I say, there's certain things that you're going to have to just give yourself leeway with. And if your whole family is eating nachos grande and, and popcorn while watching a movie, I say, make yourself some pork rinds, put a little grated cheese, heat it up. And now you've got something that you are going to be able to feel that you're not going to binge on that. You're not going to put your hand in that. You can have a whole plate of this. You know what? Go ahead and eat the whole bag of pork rinds because it's so important to understand that there are things that are really off limits because you know you've binged on popcorn and you know you'll go to town on those and you know nobody wants to put the the all those nachos in your stomach and feel like garbage and then you feel guilty and then the next day it's like well I already screwed up yesterday right. I'll start again Monday so Saturday and Sunday let's have at it and then next thing you know it's another just kind of cycle of allowing, and we'll call it a relapse, allowing yourself to have these cheat moments. And so many people say, well, I went on vacation. I gave myself permission and I was off the rails and I was off the rails for a whole year. And I put 30 back of the 50 pounds I lost. And okay. So that was a learning experience. We're not going to do that on vacation anymore. We're going to have a plan and we're going to have whatever with us. And we're going to, you know, just do it differently, but it's, it's very difficult. It really is. I think one of the struggles is that people think they have to go black and white. So when we start a carnivore diet, we're going to be picture perfect with the way we eat. But I think that middle ground you just brought up because I had to do that too. So initially when I went keto, there were days that I would binge and then I would purge on just, it would eventually go from keto treats to regular. And then carnivore, the first year was a little bumpy, but eventually I got there and I would have to tell myself that even if I struggled the next day, I better not fast. Cause that's the first thing we want to do is like, oh, I just consumed so much. I'm going to rectify the problem by fasting this morning. And then it's the old, yeah. it's the old binge restrict pattern, yeah. you know, so well, right. But and then that will make me eventually fall by the evening because, you know, then we're our cortisol's all over the place. But what saved me with even the examples you gave of like watching a movie and having the family eating all this junk. And instead of feeling bad for myself, I just started adding pork rinds. And I know in a woman's mind, we always think, man, if I eat these pork rinds, they're so high in calories. And then I add ah. this cheese or bacon or whatever to make it my version of nachos that's going to make me gain so much weight. And so we instead were like, No, I'm just not going to eat anything. I'll just have my water or my sparkling water. But in that moment, we feel this you so feel much deprived. separate, you feel deprived, right? And you yes. feel like an outsider to the family. And right. that's one of the things that a lot of people bring up with socially, whether it's your family, your friends, your coworkers, but we tend to, you know, get the eye roll, we tend to, in, in a sense, in some ways be actually shunned, you know, even especially if you give up alcohol and now all of a sudden where well, you're not getting the invites to, you know, there's a lot of things that change with this, but you know, some of it just have to accept it because it's changing for the better. Cause you know, we are who we spend our time with, right? That's, I think the important thing is to remember in that moment that even if maybe it's just getting off sugar first and so eat the pork rinds, don't worry too much about the weight loss or the weight aspect. And then once you're in a rhythm of just being able to eat mostly meat or all meat, then you could figure out, okay, yeah, maybe I eat only a quarter of the pork rinds while they're sitting and eating. And now I don't have to eat. I just bring my computer and I'll, I'll work on something or I'll just sit there and I don't need anything and I can do the water. But it's just, if we all were to take a second and go slower and just know that this is for the long haul. And instead of, I need everything perfect today because now I'm starting carnivore and now I'm going to do this. If we were to just take baby steps in a couple years, you can have a lot of healing. And that's, I think the healing that you and I have had. Yeah, it's, it for sure is a process. It's not a flip of a switch and just doesn't work like that, at least for, I think most people and for most stories that I've heard of, of back histories, because, you know, 
there's, there's a lot that can happen during this. And I'll just say from my experience with a lot of members in my group, we talk about this, that there's so much, and whether you call it transfer addiction or cross addiction, but a lot of alcoholics will turn to sugar and gain a lot of weight. Same thing with the cigarette smoking, right? Well, I'm finding that a lot of people are transferring onto binge watching Netflix series. And what it is, is they're numbing. And it really comes down to, you have to think about why you are doing something that is not ideal, right? We know watching four to seven hours in a row of, of a show, but it allows people to escape, which is what they were doing with their food, right? And is what they were doing with their alcohol. So I think it's really important to start really paying attention to your feelings and being able to sit with the feeling and not feel like we have to numb it. And right. that's a very, very difficult thing. And that's a whole nother discussion, but there's, there's a lot of, there is a lot of issues around this. And, you know, it's interesting because I, I think about you in, in, in your practice with your clients and, and they're resolving some serious health issues and, you know, between like a lot of different symptoms that are happening and all this stuff. And I'm picturing, they're all like, you know, they, they're paying attention. Okay. This is what I'm eating and I'm not going off the rails. And on, on my side of it, I have so many people that are like, well, I get 21 days in and then here I go again, you know, and, and it's, it gets very frustrating because it's a whole different aspect of this, right. but I will say too, I'm guessing you probably have a similar thing where people are like, I have every reason in the world to stick to this and I'm having a hard time. No, totally. The only reason we created a mind body group is because we saw a need for it. And one of the big things we see is addiction stems from, so I, I believe that depression, anxiety, all of these emotions we feel is our body. That symptomology we talked about is telling us, Hey, something's wrong. Go do something about it. So maybe you bunker down and you're depressed. So you're in bed and you start ruminating in a lot of things. And maybe some of the things you're thinking about are the things that you have to fix. But then we end up turning to something of an addiction. And initially it's not an addiction. You get the dopamine hit, whether it's food, drugs, alcohol, all shopping. that. Things. I feel like social media and social media, yeah. and shopping, social are media and shopping yeah. are another shopping are other ones that I see yeah. in the carnivore space a lot. And it's probably not just the carnivore space, but, and so then what happens is then you use that because you do feel better. You do escape. It allows you to get through the night, but then it becomes a habit that you can no longer control. So the one time or the few times it allows you to have that dopamine effect. Now you need more. And now it's not resolving that emptiness or escape that you wanted. And then it becomes a full on addiction. And so in our mind body program, just in one part, we talk about addiction and how usually it's because you're trying to mask something that's either like a core wound, something that happened in childhood. Maybe you felt like you didn't belong. You didn't have security. You didn't have trust. And so now whenever you feel those emotions, unknowingly, you're turning to the escape or your boss is being mean the way that your mom was to you. And so maybe you don't know how to stand up for yourself. Like it's just all these little examples, but I think at the core root of it is you have to get to those root causes and that will give you a lot of the freedom. And so to give you a picture of our, I wish our clients, and we have some really diligent clients that are like, just tell me what to do and I will follow. And they totally do that. But we have other clients that struggle. So maybe we're like, you need this one supplement to make you feel better. And they know that they should probably use it. But then within a few days, they're not feeling well, or they don't want to take it. So there's still something there too. And some people, it absolutely is the food that maybe they believe they can only tolerate beef. And so when we ask them to try to tolerate something else, like the world comes crashing down. I think it stems from a lot of the whatever you believe is your reality. And so when people are like in your practice, if they're like, after 21 days, I crash. I, I find it so funny because everyone always has a magical day they struggle. And it's like, what made it that day? And I really think it's we start thinking like, I'm going to white knuckle it for until X day. And then I can crash because that's what's been happening. And I just, we just have to challenge that as, you know, their community leaders, I guess, but yeah, they want to just get to that point where they can just give themselves permission. Like right. oh, you did so good. And now it's so difficult. Yeah. It's really difficult. And I, I always try to give people hope because you can overcome this. Yes, you can. 
But and and then I was going to mention to the that that aspect of this where sometimes even though you're on the right track, you feel a little worse before you're going to feel better. And then that's a real tough one to get people over that. And so, but it's, it's all part of it. And, you know, I always tell people, it's like, there's, there's no mistakes. You're, you're, these are learning experiences. You're figuring it out. You have to make a plan and you have to just get support and and then battle through. (laughs) There's no easy way out. And I think that all the people that are struggling can get out, but they have to just accept that it's hard, but have the hope that they can make it through. And even on days that they struggle, have grace and then keep going because one day they can heal. I truly believe that whether it's a food addiction, I always thought I would have to fight my eating disorder tendencies for the rest of my life. And oftentimes I don't now, and maybe it is because I'm meat-based and my microbiome has all healed, but, but I don't like go and dabble in sugar and test myself to see if I'm, you know, addicted or not because sugar is addictive, but I, I wanted to ask you, so carnivore has become really popular since Joe Rogan had Sean. And then ever since then there's been more, and then now there's like influencers. And so I'm just curious you being in the space for 15 years or being a carnivore for 15 years, what do you think of? the newer trends, just the space in general? I think that there's a issue around, and I'm I'm just going to say as far as the, the rules or the dogmatic attitudes about it. And I think that, you know, and, and so, and I'll use this as an example. I'm very open to say, if I am at a, a beautiful Japanese restaurant out with friends and I get salmon sashimi and they have a nice pile of cubed up fresh avocado. I eat the avocado because <laughs> I like avocado. I have portion control here. And so, okay, am I not carnivore? Um, you know, like, and then all this stuff. And I'll eat a pickle if I get a, a bunless burger and there's a pickle that comes on it. And so what, you know, but I I think that the the what I see a lot is aside from there's a big part of it me being people selling and pushing different organ supplements and the the electrolytes and all that but you know that's fine if it's 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 honestly told like some people don't need this we didn't use any of that through all the years right it, it wasn't even available and everybody seemed to be fine so i think things like that are probably more what I've, I've noticed just as a change, because it was so simple back then it was eat meat, drink water. And, and there wasn't anything other than discussion about the prior studies, the health aspects of it. But, you know, now what's so wonderful is just, you know, with Michaela Peterson and Jordan Peterson, and then Chris Palmer and all these people getting, trying just it just seems like it's such a wonderful community of people who are truly passionate to get the truth out and get information out and let people understand the toxic food system that we're in. And so I'm going to say for the most part, I, that's just been wonderful. The people are so genuine and I I'm like, you know, I'm like so happy that, you know, I was able to, after just kind of doing my thing for 10 years that all of a sudden I was like, okay, this is kind of fun. You guys want to hear what I have to say? Cause I've been doing it so long and it's, it's just been really great. And I, 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 you know, even I think it's all the conflicting information that becomes difficult for people. And that's what I wish some of that could go away. And I, I guess it's really not because th- there's always going to be differing opinions. So and I think it's just a, a healthy, positive environment as long as, you know, you do the thing where you, you take what you, you think is valuable and you leave the rest. Yeah, I, I think overall it has really blossomed so that more people can know. And I think that's all good. I, I, I do think it is a dilemma where you're saying there's different opinions. And I, I think you're right my journey is probably slightly, even though we struggle with similar things, I think our journeys are slightly different too. And so then our opinions will be different because of what our own N equals one is. And then I'm sure all the other people when they have their differences. And so they will come from that place. So it's not like they're trying to be controversial with me or you or whoever, but the one thing I do see that I struggle with a little bit seeing as, so we get the tail end of everybody. So when people are saying, Hey, I just started carnivore. We're like, 
use our free guides, use our, get our free book or like get some of the free stuff that we, because we give it out our carnivore cures, elimination protocol, the food emergent, we give out all of that for free. We have tons of articles. And so we'll say to do that first. And then when it's not working enough, like that's when you may want to consider to work with us, but we have, so in our questionnaire, we ask who have you worked with in the low carb space? And we have seen several names come up consistently where maybe their groups are doing a little bit more harm. And I wouldn't be saying this if it was your group, okay? but <laughs> um, where one they'll one. say, oh, I, you know, did X a bit too much and now this is ruined or this has gotten worse. And we'll never know if it's, well, maybe it's just because you started carnivore and you did it wrong. I mean, who knows, but we have seen that consistently and that's where I'm sure if we hear it to the extent we do, and maybe we're just getting just a subset of the the ones that it doesn't work out for. But if they hear any of that, I wish that some of these leaders in the space can pivot and share, hey, this may be not ideal for a certain community member or certain groups of people or certain ages or certain genders. This might not work because we get then the aftermath of it, of people's thyroid tanking or hormones or I went on this calorie regimen and it just broke me and, or like I added fruit now and the fruit then made me now on a standard American diet for a few years. And I just wish, and maybe, maybe they all do it. And I just don't watch the content enough, but I wish there were disclaimers. And I try to do that very well, where I think carnivore, sometimes you do have to go really strict to um, get the true benefits of carnivore. And some people can just be meat based and that'll be good enough. But I, I think that's the only I I don't know people's intent, but sometimes I see groups, the community aspect is so big and so huge. And I hear the most positive things about that, but the recommendations when you don't work one-on-one with people and their medical history, that's where I see the harm come in. And we see a little bit too much of that, that I wish somehow we could magically fix. And I don't even know how we could fix that, but as a community, I would love it. Yeah. And one of the things as you were talking that kind of hit hit me is I I think is the whole fasting thing. And <laughs> I feel like there's, there's so much, let's just say conflicting information. Sure. Maybe there's valid information for this person, but it's right. really not good for that. And that's really right. kind of what you were saying. And, totally. and there's, you know, some influencers out there that it's like, here we go. This is what you do. And this is how you get into autophagy. And this is how you lose belly fat. And this is how you start losing your hair or you start binging or, you know, they're, they're not talking about that kind of thing, but that I, th- I think it's important for everybody, especially, and I get it, you know, it's like, well, what am I supposed to do with the conflicting information? Right. How do I know? What am I supposed to do? What's right for me? And, you know, I, I think one of the best things to say is don't do anything to an extreme, you know, and, and ease into things and just try to change your eating window at first. But yeah, th- I think that's a lot of, a lot of confusion is on that topic. And, and, and a lot of the drive is because there's some, you know, a lot of people are so set on the weight loss aspect of yeah. this, as opposed to health. And, I, I tell, you know, even with the people who I'm coaching, who, you know, the majority of them need and want to lose weight because they've got a binge history. Right. And I said, we got to fix that first before we start thinking about anything else, because unless you're, you're satiated, you can't be hungry, or this is not going to work. Mm-hmm. And until you start learning and fixing your relationship with food and do a lot of other things then, then we'll be able to work on that. But it's a tough carnivore world out here, Judy, right? I mean, well, that's why it goes back to what we're talking about when people are eating, like your family's having popcorn, the probably best thing to do is so that you don't feel deprived is to get some of that pork rinds, but people will do the math of that is so high in calories. It's processed. It's probably better. This is outside of my eating window. And then you deprive yourself more that eventually one day you will feel bad for yourself because you had a hard day. Work was hard. Kids were hard. Whatever was hard that then you're like, I don't care. And then you just go on the deep end. And I just, I just think if we could as a community really just empower the individual more, because we even try to do that with the food and mood journal. Like, I don't know exactly why the macros eating this way, a certain amount of meat, et cetera, is not working for you. Why don't you try your food and mood journal? 
after every meal, how do you feel? Do you have food eating disorder uh, tendencies coming up? And I think the more somebody understands their own needs, they're the ones living in their body and no one else will know what's driving them to go want to eat some junk food or go not want to eat carnivore except for them. And so, but we've been raised and taught to not trust our own selves. So if people use their own food and mood journal, they could start figuring out, for example, I mean, that's really the way that we try to empower people, but you are your own best advocate. And so if you, instead of, I know we see an influencer and we're like, oh my gosh, they're so thin and pretty and wonderful. Like if I just eat their way, then I'll be exactly like them. And it never works. Because everybody is just striving for the answer. Give me the answer and I'll do it. And right. there's that's that's the problem. But yeah. the funny thing is, if it was truly just about being educated and knowing the answer, librarians would be the richest people in the world. And we know that it's not the case. We know, so most people don't think carnivore is good. But if you grabbed a random person off the street and said, do you think eating Pizza Hut or McDonald's is healthy for you? All of them would say no, yet they still make billions of dollars. And so we know it's, there is something beyond just the education. And so if we understand that, if we can figure out what is triggering me to want to grab something else, or what is triggering me to have the disordered eating, and maybe this is where the communities are important to provide that support, but it is definitely more than just the education piece. So I think that's where you know, we really try to just empower the individual. You do group coaching and then you also do retreats. Can you tell me a little bit about both? Yeah. So the retreats are, came about from how magical I feel meetups are. And when you're meeting face-to-face and you're talking and you're sharing stories and you're around people who get it and around people who are eating this and around people who are flying their freak flag with you. Right. And it just, it, it was such a wonderful experience every time I was to one or hosted one. And then, so the retreats kind of came as a natural progression out of that, where I just wanted to have people actually just live with me for five days and, you know, just talk about anything and everything throughout the days and, and, and have that community of others who, you know, we're, we're out at the fire pit chatting and just talking about life. And these are the kind of things that this, you know, this isn't all just about food. Like I said, we have to understand the emotional voids that we have that and, and why we react the ways we we do. And I just find these retreats, you know, it's like, I, it's the cooking demo and it's the grounding outside. And it's just trying to say, you know, we need to concentrate on health and outside nature. And I'm fortunate to live on the beach and I'm fortunate to have the retreats here on the beach, but go outside, spend time out in the daylight. And, and then they can come to the gym with me and see how I work out. And then I have a little sauna, I have a little wellness room and it, it just, you know, I, I've real I've had two of them now and I, I host them every month and it is, it, like I said, the only thing I can say, they're just magical that just the way it is just to bring people together. And I I think that there's so much in my group coaching, there's so much conversation about people saying, I just wish my husband would blah, blah, blah. I just wish my wife would, I have only my kids would listen. They're both over 300 pounds. And it's, it's just, you know, you're so engrossed in your life and your, your, you know, people get despondent about, and I think I, talk to you about this when we were in Austin, Judy, I said, my gosh, I'm like, so in awe of you that your parents kind of came, came over to the carnivore side, you know, came to the animal side. And, you know, as hard as I've tried for all these years, I couldn't get, you know, my parents to listen to me and, and, and people get frustrated because they want, they, they want the best for their loved ones, just, you know, like you did. And, so it, I don't know, the retreats just really come to be a place where anything and everything that you want to talk about that is related to this whole lifestyle is, is just becomes so comfortable and nobody's judging and everybody is here and being supportive. And I, I, 
Yeah. I just can't say enough about just, you know, get, getting together. Now I'm ready to, I'm starting to plan a winter retreat where I would like to, and it might be a cruise and it might be a, a resort situation, but I was thinking if everybody had silicone <laughs> bracelet, like a bright color, and then anywhere you go, like sitting down at a meal or, a you know, a buffet or out by the pool or whatever that, you know, who's on your, who's in your tribe. And again, it's just about the connection. It's because I know, I don't know, Judy, like you, you have, you have your, your family as a unit is totally on board with this, but so many people feel so isolated in their own family. And, and it's really troublesome and sad because I say, you know, we have no control over what somebody else chooses to eat. So it's, it's a tough road. And that's, part of why I just feel so strongly about the meetups, the retreats and the membership groups. Yeah. I never take it for granted that I have such a strong foundation with my husband and then my kids. So I I, I am very fortunate and I know how important that is to be able to do this long-term. I don't know if I would have been able to do this long-term without them either. Um, I had a friend that tried to do carnivore on her own probably for six months. And then she happened to visit me in Austin. So she slept over And I didn't think anything of, I thought she was just coming to hang out with me. And the whole time she was eating carnivore with me or whatever I was eating, she was just following suit. And I didn't know anything that she realized anything through me because it's just my life now. And she said, oh my gosh, being with you and immersed in the way you eat carnivore and how it's so normal, I think I could do it. And she finally, I think she's been doing carnivore for nine months now straight. But before she tried and she couldn't do it. And so I think there is a power in immersion and just knowing that, oh, this is very normal. These ladies aren't like weirdos and and there's more to them than just eating meat. They talk about their struggles of wanting their other loved ones to be healthier and we eat meat and we and then we live our lives. And I think just seeing how normal it could be helps people to wake up and see let's say a mom wanted to bring her daughter and she was reluctant, but if she was just hanging out with you guys, like, Hey, you're going to be at the beach and you get to go to a resort and they just are with you. And then they hear the conversations and the ability to heal. And I've done this and I've lost weight. And now I have this freedom. I think they will be curious. And it's all about planting that seed so that when the daughter, let's say has a bout of depression or is struggling, they might go, I might just do carnivore now. And I think that's the power of these groups, just the constant immersion and making it so normalized because it is very normal. Again, I didn't think anything of it with my friend, but for her, it was such an eye opening weekend and, and it allowed her to be a carnivore long-term and it's, it's fascinating. So I, yeah, that's it. wonderful. Yeah. And I think that's part of what it is at, at the retreat is that it is just, you know, obviously after 15 years, this is just totally normal for me to yeah. just, you know, throw on some steaks and have a side of shrimp with it. And I don't think twice, but other people, it's like, wow, these are this, I could do this, you know, look how good this food is. And it's not just about eating a burger every meal. So yeah, it's great. If I were to leave with a, like a one tip thing of 15 years carnivore, you obviously do not look like you're turning 60. I always think you're so much younger just because you look so young and healthy. And I see you in person and you look exactly the same, but in terms of your recommendations after 15 years, is there like one thing, whether it's like a message of hope or a tool or a recommendation, a pro tip that you would leave with? Yeah. I think one of the things that I often find important for people to understand is you have to remember, are you 40, 50, 60 years old? Have you eaten 40, 50, 60 years another way? You have to be patient with this. This isn't going to flip on a dime. This isn't, you know, I know you see all these things on Instagram, (laughs) the transformation Tuesdays, and you see all of this stuff happening, but you know, sometimes it's people who have been at it for a little while, but I have so many times I'll have somebody who's, let's say 65 years old and they're going, but I've done this for three months now. And I still have X, Y, or Z. I go, all right, that's a little blip on the radar in your life of eating garbage. Right. (laughs) So yeah, yeah, just being patient and consistent. Those are really the, the two things is be consistent in your, in your resolve to say, I've decided what is healthy to put in my mouth. Yes. And every moment, what I put in here, it's either leading to health or harm. And it's your 100% under, you know, 
you have control over that and really think about that because it's the consistency that's going to win in the end. I love it. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. If people were to want to join your group, because I'm sure more people would want to get to know you through the groups and then maybe they can consider your retreats, but tell us where they can join your groups. How does it function? Who is, who is your group for? Is it, is it only for disordered eating? Is it for anyone outside of carnivore? I mean, just tell me a little bit more about the groups where they can find it. And then some, I guess maybe a link for your retreats. Yeah. So my groups are open for anybody and everybody. I, and it, I do it. You can't be vegetarian. You're not allowed (laughs) in, (laughs) but basically keto, ketovore, carnivore, carnivore ish, all of that, you know, cause again, I'm not dogmatic. I'm trying to get people to succeed and to be, you know, at peace with their food. But yeah, I go live about five or six days a week, every week with my group. Yeah. And, and then there's a whole resource section in there. It's on mighty network. And uh, there is a pretty big emphasis on staying out of the ditch and being consistent. So I will say that it's typically not a person who's just, you know, on carnivore and just has no issues. Cause usually you're, you're coming into a group because you need that support. And I have, sometimes I have some guest speakers and, and, and really it is my way of just helping give people the motivation and the, uh, a platform for them to be able to connect with others. So that's, that's the big thing. And so that I'll, I'll give you the link to that. And then I have a website for my, my beach retreats. Where can you be found on social media? Instagram carnivore doctor and YouTube, same carnivore doctor. And I actually have a second YouTube channel, Carnivore Eye Doctor, where I try to just mainly emphasize all vision and ocular health, but that's just a very small starting channel. But yeah, I enjoy, I I really enjoy the interaction because like, you know, the people in this community are, are just really sincere, really motivated to get healthy and that's, that's what I love. I, I, I love seeing that people are not going to stay in the, the system, the sick care system, and they want out. And that's what fires me up. <laughs> yeah. I think outside of social media, when you really meet people like at the meetups or at KetoCon or hack your health, you see the individuals that are struggling and it helps you to understand there's no point in being dogmatic because one person to another will never be the same. And I think this diet, once you really find benefits from it, you'll start waking up to everything else we're being lied to, which is a lot. I mean, it literally if you follow everything, the opposite of what is recommended, you'll probably pretty, be pretty good or yeah. far. So, well, thank you so much again for joining me. I will put all of your, your group, your information, your social media in the show notes, but it's always a pleasure. So thank Thanks you so thank much, you Judy. Appreciate it. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this interview. I hope it shares a lot more of the importance of self-empowerment and learning what works for you rather than just following some of the trends that are out there. Carnivore can be followed long-term and sometimes being dogmatic is not an ideal thing. Now, sometimes we need to go super strict to find the benefits of carnivore. And for some people, it's not just carnivore alone. Whatever the case may be, you have to find your individual healing and modalities and also be very honest with yourself in terms of the healing and what you've been trying. I have been to some of the carnivore meetups that Dr. Lisa Wiedemann has hosted, and I highly recommend considering her groups or even some of her retreats as she will help you to understand how simple this way of eating can be, how there's community and the importance of community, and also getting to root cause healing the day to day to really fully heal. She gave me a peek into her Mighty Networks group community, and it's a lot of information and you really get a lot for what she charges. I think it's $50 a month. So it's really a steal. She meets with her group several times a week. Now, not every group is perfect for everyone, but I just think there's so many people that truly need community and finding your group or your tribe is so important. Okay, guys, make sure to eat a lot of meat. Take care of your bodies because it is the only place you have to live. I will talk to you later. Bye guys.